Hi, I'm Alex Howard, and welcome to the show. My guest in the studio today is Martin Elwood. Hi, Martin. Hi. And Martin is a Buddhist teacher who has been teaching retreats around the world for the last 15 years. And he is particularly known for developing innovative ways of bringing Buddhist teaching into everyday life. And in today's interview, we're going to be talking about a workshop that Martin runs called Work, Sex, Money, Dharma. So, Martin, maybe as a starting point, why did you put this workshop together? Well, it began really with sensing the gap that was there between uh, Buddhist teachings as they've been developed in a predominantly Asian and predominantly monastic context over the last two and a half thousand years, you know, and then starting to come uh, more and more into uh, the West, into contemporary life, if you like. And yet, the people they're addressing predominantly in our culture are people living a uh, lay life. And so, those elements of the teachings and the practices and the emphasis that really point quite specifically and purposefully away from these charged areas of life. Um, you know, there's a sense, and with good reason, really, in a monastic context, it's like, well, recognizing that these are really charged areas of life. So how are we going to deal with the fact that uh, this stuff of one's working life and one's career and who one takes one's, oneself to be in that and all the energy that goes into it, what, what are we going to do with that? Let's withdraw from it. And then there's the intensity and charge around sex and intimate relationship, and how much energy that takes, and how much uh, investment there is in that. Okay, well, let's withdraw from that as well. And then dealing with money, oh, that's complicated, and that takes a lot of it. So let's withdraw from that as well. So these three areas are the areas that traditional, the traditional context of practice chooses to withdraw from, to, from in order to kind of have the space from that, in order to explore one's consciousness, and uh, see one's habitual patterns, etc. And obviously that space, in a sense, is important because it gives people the space to step away and to reflect. But I guess the danger is it creates the experience where there's someone's spiritual life that happens in one place and their worldly life that happens in their daily life. And that creates somewhat of a split bet right. between those two places. Right. And those, those contexts exist and are very powerful and important contexts, right? So when people go on retreat, for example, they go into a, a sort of microcosmic version of that where they leave behind those charged areas for the few days or the few weeks that they might be in a retreat environment. And those are often very, very powerful kind of training periods and periods of great insight and transformation. And then the retreat ends and the holding that you've got and the teachings that you've got within that retreat environment tend to just not be enough to support you with re-engaging with not just your daily life in general, but particularly these areas of life that exert so much pull on us. And so the intention was to, to have a body of teachings and a way of accompanying people in their life that really addressed these areas specifically. Yes, because of course I think many people have had the experience of being on retreat and feeling very spacious and feeling a sense of connectedness and, and often feeling, as, as I guess I speak from personal experience here, feeling a sense of kind of excitement and optimism to bring that into their life. And there somehow seems to be a gradual losing of that connection as life kind of unfolds. And you know, one of the things that particularly strikes me about the format that you use in the in-person version of Work, Sex, Money, Dharma is that you have a weekend where everyone comes together and then you have a series of evenings following from that weekend where people live their life, so they go to work, and then they come to the workshop in the evening. So there's that kind of bridging the gap, I guess, of that integration. 
What, what, what have you noticed as being the effect of, of working in that way? Well, that's very much, you know, that's settings really important to the course because it seemed counterproductive. I don't want to try and teach and accompany people in those areas in an environment where they're withdrawn from them. So I purposely wanted to do it in a way that wasn't residential and was in an urban setting. And so that as we, through the teachings and the sort of intensity of the weekend, and then the accompaniment that's there with people through the week, that they're sort of constantly in relationship with the exploring of that and then the, the living of it. And it's in a way the to and fro of that, the being, having uh, your own sort of patterning and reactivity kind of seen up close as it's playing out in your day-to-day -day life, in your relationships and in dealing with money and in going to work. And then having both the teachings that explore that and the support of a community and the guidance of a teacher yes. to keep coming back each evening and seeing, you know, what's happening and what is the patterning that's getting uh, triggered and how can you open that up and work with it. Yes, because I mean, it, part of what it, it seems to me is that a lot of inner work is a teaching around spaciousness and quietness and solitude and there's a great difficulty when someone's got a daily life which is about noise and complexity and dealing with stickiness in relationship w w with, with different people. And I think often it seems to me what can happen is that when we're having that kind of worldly experience, it feels like something that's in the way of our inner practice as opposed to perhaps part of our inner practice. Is, is, is that in a sense how you're, how you're approaching it within this? Mm. Well, yeah, part, I mean, partly the problem is, in a way, in the setup of a retreat environment, right? You bring people into an environment which is, like I say, it's very powerful and it's protected and it's important. But the very elements that are in place, the silence and the simplicity and the slowing down, people tend to mistake those elements for what the practice is about, mm. as if it always ought to feel slow and simple, etc., so then you tend to, because the slowness and simplicity is so valuable in helping you connect with the immediacy of life in your own consciousness, you tend to kind of take that back into your life expecting or that you should still feel some slowness and simplicity. And then when life gets more complex and speeded up, it feels like something is lost. Yes. And yet actually, the immediacy of life and the mysteriousness of consciousness and just the, and the intimacy of our participation in what's happening right now isn't dependent on how fast things are moving, mm. isn't dependent on whether uh, there's a simplicity or a complexity to the situation. And so that's where the real value is in the course is bringing people again and again to the recognition of life's extraordinary mysterious imminence mm. regardless of what's yeah. happening and having that be the kind of the ground again the ground in which one then comes to the exploration of relationship yes. of money etc yes because i mean I, you know and again I, I speak somewhat from personal experience i, I think there's a, a developmental phase i guess that people go through where it feels like some things are for want of a better word, spiritual, and other things aren't. And so it feels like this is my spiritual life and this is something else which is kind of, which is not spiritual somehow. And, you know, I, I, I somewhat wonder that some of those ideas can be fed by some of the origins of certain teachings that it's about getting away from those unspiritual things towards what is spiritual. And, you know, it, it somewhat, it strikes me that Many spiritual teachers, for example, when they live a monastic life, they very deliberately don't have sex. They're not in intimate relationship. Money is something that they don't deal with. And that, that somehow feeds that idea. I'm curious as to your, as your thoughts. Well, I think it's what's helpful is to, rather than seeing in terms of spiritual or not spiritual, is just to see in terms of opportunity mm. to learn, opportunity to meet life, opportunity to deepen one's connection with and exploration of what's happening. And one could say, well, 
everything has that same opportunity, which is true, but it turns out that the areas of life that exert the most charge on us, the ones that are the most compelling, because of their, their charge, have the most opportunity. Yeah. You know, you get to see yourself in these areas of life in a way that you don't mm. in others. So if you take the, the intimacy of sexual relationship, an intimate relationship, there's a kind of nakedness, I mean, figuratively as well as literally, <laughs> sure. right? a kind of vulnerability there. Yeah. That, you, that it's easy to hide from yourself in different relationships, yeah. collegial relationships, friendships, even family to a certain extent. You can kind of, you can keep up playing a version of yourself that in the intimacy of sexual relationship, just, you know, c you can only sustain for so long, right? Before the other per person sees through your bullshit, right. basically. <laughs> right. And so that's a great opportunity. Well, it's either welcome or it's not welcome. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but hopefully it's welcome. Right. And so actually the w it's like, oh, having spent quite a l some years in a more monastic environment mm -hmm. and in a more sort of conventionally spiritual environment, as it were, I started to really value these places that exert that kind of charge because mm -hmm. I got to see myself at my, at my most provoked. Mm at my most um, confused, in a way. And that starts to be valuable, where, because this seems like, oh, one gets a certain degree of spaciousness around what's happening, around the less charged stuff. Right? But these are the areas that tend to kind of uh, trip us up. Yeah, no, I mean, I very much resonate with, with what you're saying. I mean, the, the second half of my 20s, you know, I was very committed to my spiritual practice. I was meditating every day. I was spending a month a year on retreat. And I was going from one relationship disaster to another. And I was like, what's wrong with me? You know, and it, it, it was an extraordinary opportunity just to see a whole load of stuff that I couldn't see on a meditation cushion. I couldn't see on retreat where I could melt into the field and what was happening there. It wasn't showing that. And I, I'm curious as to what how it's been received in the, especially in the, in the Buddhist community that I know you've, you've had a lot of um, involvement in over the years, that these, these are areas that I know in some areas that, it's not much they're dirty words, but they're just not really things that are talked about. And to make them so explicit, I'm curious as to, as to how that's been received by people. Um, that's a good question. It's, it's bit, w interest in some quarters sort of a raised eyebrow and maybe <laughs> slightly disapproving uh, sense in others. Um, I think partly it's a generational thing as well. A lot of my sort of friends and colleagues among Dharma teachers who were of a sort of generation older than me, mm. I think they felt a lot of responsibility for bringing the teachings as they learned and practiced them in yes. Asia to the West, as it mm. were, and setting up retreat centers, etc. Mm. And you know, and that was an important thing, and th there has been a fantastic work there. In such a, there's lots of places to do great retreats now, and it seems like the challenge, in a way, of the next generation to make that transition from, so that transformational practice doesn't stay just in the mm -hmm. retreat center, mm -hmm. right? Because that's, of course, then that's really limited. Right. Yeah, and it's. You know, in a sense, what I'm hearing you say is that everyday life is, in a sense, its own invitation to awakening. And as you, as you said, often the most challenging life experiences are often the greatest invitation. But of course, that also requires someone to be open to that invitation. And I guess I'm also curious about that and, and how you see people in their journey to seeing these things as kind of things to not want to deal with, to actually recognizing th the potential gift and the, the invitation in those experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the potency of having of the course in a way, is that there's an accompaniment to mm -hmm. people of that. So, you know, and I try to just to raise, you know, what the stuff, the way those things have caught me and confused me over years. Mm -hmm. And speaking about the sort of the, uh, the styles in which we tend to react around those things, the ways we tend to go unconscious or get uncomfortable or whatever. And, and then just sort of fee feel the fallout with people as they, as they kind of uh, 
sort of enter the the painful territory mm -hmm. of seeing their own uh, reactivity and uh, underlying beliefs around stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's interesting, like with money, for money's an interesting one. I was just going to ask you, I right. want to talk about money. Cause well, I, because that's for most people, it seems like it's going to be the least provocative. Like with work, everybody knows they've got issues around work yeah. and we don't mind talking about it. Oh, I've got this problem at work yeah. and then... Yeah. Uh, so we know we've got issues around work and we'll f happily talk about them. Yeah. Sex and intimacy is different than that in as much as we know we have issues around it, <laughs> but we don't like to talk about <laughs> we them know so we much. Like to talk about <laughs> it. Yeah. So they tend to be a little more underground. Yeah. The specific thing with money is we don't even know we've got issues around money. Or we think we've got a simple issue, which is we'd like a bit more of it yeah. or something. You see, the money one, it, it, it really interests me as well, having over the years had somewhat of a foot in the kind of more personal development mm -hmm. kind of world, and I guess a larger foot in the more kind of spiritual kind of exploration kind of world. And in the personal development world, bordering into the more spiritual, there's a lot of what for me is, I guess I would say nonsense around, you know, follow your path and the money will come. And, and there's a kind of worshipping of money as a thing of, you know, the more money you have, the more developed you are in some way. And then we have this kind of odd territory in between, as I say, which I just, I find odd. And then there's the place where almost money is kind of wrong and you shouldn't have too much, but then not having money causes a whole set of stresses and pressures, especially if you're raising children. It's mm. hugely difficult if you're not, if you haven't got enough to support that, that, that structure. Um, so I'm, re I'm curious as to, as you've been running these groups and talking about money, like what, what's the response to that? And well, like I said, partly the response is people f realizing that, oh, that it's much, it's much more, it's got a lot more charge than mm. they thought it had and mostly that's exploring how you know our relationship with money shows us so much about our relationship with life in general yeah you know that it's it's actually when you you see how you are with money and how whether the degree to which you move towards or away from mm. or just kind of check out yeah, and yeah. you know some people don't really know much about what there's going on in their financial life those are the three movements, yes. right? Yes. They tend to be the more, what we might call the worldly movement of wanting more. Kind of grabbing. What kind within of the Buddhist yeah. tradition you'd call the more grasping yes. relationship or the more aversive relationship, right? Which is the more sort of pseudo-spiritual, money's impure and unspiritual yeah. and I'm going to do without and as if there's some great virtue in not mm -hmm. having much money or something. And then there's just, there's just the sort of confused, deluded, uh, unconscious relationship yeah. where I just don't like to out. think about it. Yeah, yeah. And then people getting to see how those movements reflect, you know, something to do with confidence, something to do with uh, actually a sense of prosperity in life, a sense of buoyancy in life, a sense of tr the degree to which one trusts one's capacity to be in life, to listen to life, to respond to life, mm. and to feel kind of buoyant within life, supported by life. Mm. And though that's kind of like wealth, the word wealth, if I just think of it with a slightly different spelling, you know, with, without, and with the W-E-L-L, -L, wealth. Mm. And also the word prosperity. You know, we tend to think of both of those words in purely financial terms. Yes. But actually, what I've found is investigating one's relationship with money as it frees up, the sense of prosperity, of feeling the blessings of life, of existing in a, a condition of appreciation and gratitude, feeling one's own capacity to be, to be generous mm -hmm. and kind of at ease around money. That's what really frees up yes. much more significantly than the stuff about how much of it one has. Mm -hmm. One's capacity to feel prosperous and buoyant and at, at ease isn't very much to do with, yes. w with whether one has this much or that yes. much. One can live within one's means in a very, you know, in a great bandwidth of what those means are. Yes. But often we're living at the edge of our means or we're living as if things would be better if only I had 10 or 20% more yes. means, which but far from buoyancy or uh, prosperity conditions a sense of lack, a sense of insecurity, a sense of neediness. And that's not stuff. Isn't just about money. That's about how we relate sure, to all kinds sure. of things. Sure, and you know, it 
it never ceases to amaze me how you see over the years people people earn more money and they always seem often often to spend therefore more money and the same people always seem to never really have enough money and the same people seem to always have too much but be kind of not want to touch it or and it seems to be that someone's relationship with money doesn't seem to have a lot to do with how much of it they do have or they don't have yeah. um yeah, it, yeah you know and, and, and it, obviously this is a, a much bigger area than we've got a couple of minutes left that we can kind of really kind of get into but it would be interesting to explore it kind of separately um but i it would be interesting just to get a bit of a sense of in a practical sense through because i'm aware that work sex money dharma in addition to the um in-person format you also have a version that you run people do from from home effectively yeah a month-long online course yeah so in terms of the the practical elements how are you supporting people actually working mm -hmm. with, with, with this kind of material well, there's a, a ground of supporting them first in their meditation practice so that you're actually attuned to what's happening and you can feel the pull, or what I've been calling the charge mm -hmm. of these things when you're in touch with them. And then that's further supported by teachings that, that point to how we, most of us get caught and the different directions we get caught. And then a bunch of different exercises for really for recognizing your tendencies mm -hmm. and patterns, where those come from, you know, your own personal history, like, how was money in your family? You know, how did you learn just by picking it up about how to relate to money? Whether there was an ease around that or, or an insecurity or a sense of lack or whatever. And I guess there's often either a copying of that or a reaction against that. Yeah, to a certain extent. Yeah. Or, or all kinds of variations mm. thereof, actually. Mm. But it's like you f really find your own variations through, so, through sort of uncovering what you what people kind of already know, and yet because it's sort of painful and it's to do with reactivity, we spend a lot of time pushing it away. Mm -hmm. So it's really supporting people to stop pushing it away, to bring it into the light of awareness and give it the space and the inquiry and the kind of the caring attention in which it can actually just start to, to uh, digest and free up. Yeah, okay. Yeah. There's obviously a lot more we could say here, and hopefully we'll have some more conversations about some of these details. But for now, thank you, Martin. Um, if people want to find out more, the website, it's worksexmoneydharma.com. <laughs> Great, well done. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for watching. And we look forward to talking with you again, hopefully, very soon. Bye-bye.